Hello everyone, welcome back to the black hole project. In this video we're going to add some rotation to the accretion disk. Accretion disks are not perfectly uniform in density. They have clumps of higher density and cavities of lower density. Today we are implementing this clumpiness. Before we can do so though, we need to understand how the gas orbits the black hole. Gas in an accretion disk orbits, by a very good approximation, in what is called Keplerian rotation. This means it orbits in a circular orbit, and the speed with which it orbits is determined by Kepler's laws, which dictates an orbital speed inversely proportional to the square root of the distance to the central object. It will be easier for us to work with the angular velocity, which is the orbital speed divided by the distance, so that is proportional to r to the power of minus 3 over 2. Obviously, if the gas would orbit in a perfectly circular orbit, there would be nothing accreting onto the black hole. So it can't have perfect Keplerian rotation, but it's very close. This means that in an accretion disk there is a lot of stuff orbiting around, but very little is actually falling onto the black hole. Most of the gas is just orbiting in a nearly circular orbit, very slowly spiraling inwards. We can visualize this motion with a bunch of random points around the central object, which looks like this. For our disk, we'll want to use a noise texture to create clumps, and rotating the texture will make those clumps orbit around the black hole. We have a problem, however. We cannot just rotate the texture faster near the center and slower further away, because that looks like this. We would get infinite shearing if we would let this go on forever. Instead of rotating the entire texture, let's focus on a few rings around the black hole. Imagine these rings being infinitely thin and I'll increase the contrast of the texture a bit so it's easier to see. We know how to describe the rotation of all these rings, right? They rotate with an angular velocity proportional to r to the power of minus 3 over 2. We can take any number of rings and we could describe their rotation. The problem is what we do with all of the space in between the rings. Well, what we could do is fill the area in between two rings by interpolating radially between them. So for example, this point has a value of 0.1, and moving radially outwards to the next ring, this point has a value of 0.6. So on this line, we interpolate between 0.1 and 0.6. Doing that for all areas in between the rings looks like this. With just a few rings, it doesn't look very good, but if we increase the amount of rings, it starts to look quite believable. There are multiple ways to interpolate between two rings. You can do it linearly, which looks like this, or using a smoother function, like a squared sine, which looks like this. I think the sine looks better, so I'll be using that one. Let's get to work in Unity. We'll start with a subgraph for our noise texture. This takes in 2D polar coordinates, so phi and r, and returns the value of the texture. First, we have to convert polar coordinates to Cartesian UV coordinates. This is simply done by taking the cosine and the sine of phi, and multiplying by r. Then we need to sample some type of noise. Unity has a gradient noise node. I'm not going to discuss the details of how this noise texture is generated, but it's actually quite interesting. Just google Perlin noise and you'll find lots of great videos explaining how it works. This is how it looks. It is a smooth noise texture with a certain typical length scale of variation. Increasing the scale input of the node will result in smaller scale variations. That seems a bit backwards to me, but I guess it's like the scale of the UVs. This texture is usable, but kind of bland. We can make our noise texture more interesting by creating something often referred to as fractal noise. It is a noise texture created by adding multiple gradient noises with different scales, where each subsequent gradient noise has smaller scale variations and magnitude. For example, you can take each subsequent gradient noise texture to be of double the scale of the previous one, and half as strong. Adding more and more gradient noises in this way adds more detail to the texture, while keeping large scale variations. I'm going to use fractal noise with two layers. It's barely worth the name fractal noise, but it creates enough variations in the noise, and using fewer layers is obviously cheaper. You can use more layers if you like. So we create a variable for the noise scale, and for the second layer we multiply that by 2. Then the second layer is multiplied by 0.5 and added to the first layer. Since these gradient noises return values between 0 and 1, we have to divide by 1.5 to make sure all values are still between 0 and 1. 
In a second subgraph, we'll do the rotation of the texture. We start by creating the rings. This can be done by taking R and modulo some value, which is a ring width. Subtract that from R and we get the radius of the ring. Dividing the result of this modulo by the ring width gives us the linear interpolation factor. If we want to do the smooth interpolation, we can multiply this by pi over 2, take the sine and square it. Now we want to sample the noise texture on this ring. So we bring in the fractal noise and add a parameter for the texture scale. We can connect R and phi and this shows us the texture sampled on each ring. To make this texture rotate, we need to change phi over time. So we bring in time and multiply it by a rotation speed. Remember the angular velocity of the orbit is proportional to r to the power of minus 3 over 2, so we multiply this by r to the power of minus 1.5. Then we add that to phi. This will rotate the texture, but it still looks a bit off. This is because at time equal to 0 we have basically our original texture, and so all rings are correlated to their neighbors. If we wait long enough, this disappears and we get what we are looking for. To fix this, we can add a random rotation to each ring to begin with, and break this correlation from the start. So take r, use it to sample a random value between 0 and 2 pi, and add that to phi. All that is left to do is to interpolate between the rings. To get the next ring, copy-paste all of this and add a ring width to R. Then we simply lerp between these two rings. Finally, we want some control over the contrast and the range of this texture. We can do this with a remap node. Adjusting the in-range controls the contrast, and adjusting the out-range controls the range of the values. Finally, just to be sure, we clamp this between 0 and 1. Let's bring this into our main shader, and create parameters for the inputs. We can also connect R. For phi, we don't have anything to connect yet, we still need to calculate it. We can do this in the phi p subgraph. We can simply take the disk vector, split it, and take the arctangent 2 of y and x, and let's return it as phi d. Back in our main shader, we then take this phi d and bring it over to our subgraph. And we need to do the same for the second intersection as well. After some adjusting of parameters, this is how it looks. I think it looks cool, it's a lot more dynamic now. That's it for this video, we are closing in on the end of this series. There is one more thing to add to the black hole, and if I find the time there is something we can do with the environment as well. Thank you for watching, and I hope to see you in the next one.